Hello and welcome back. And that is right, today I wanted to take an opportunity on a relatively clear day to talk about the subject of cloud. And in 2024, I think it would be safe to say that the price of cloud storage has frankly gone bonkers. And in this video, I'm going to quickly outline not only some of the cost differences between buying your own server versus that of using cloud services, but also later on some of those hidden costs. We do a video like this every year, but today, just to sort of freshen things up a little bit, I thought I would change the horizons here for us. So, number one, let's say, for example, you want to keep it domestic. I think whenever we talk to users that are going for entry-level storage, they generally sit around four terabytes. Four terabytes is largely considered to be the entry point, therefore relatively long-term storage for the average user. Now, on a cloud service platform, we're gonna look at platforms like Backblaze. We're also gonna look at some of the Microsoft offerings with OneDrive. We're gonna look at Google Drive and stuff like that. And you tend to find that the price for four terabytes comes in at between $190 and $399. And I'm aware how vague that sounds, but the reason is, a lot of cloud service providers do not offer a 4TB option. They tend to offer 1TB, 2TB, and then scalable. And then it gets kind of tiered at the 5, at the 10, and then all the way up, because that's when you start tippy-toeing into business. So let's use that number between $200 and $400 for cloud storage with your domestic entry-level cloud providers. Now, with that in mind, when we look at NAS servers, if we look at the two arguable market leaders on entry-level servers, Synology and QNAP, Synology have got the B station, a 4TB one bay model, and that retails for between $199 and $299, depending on where you are in the world and your tax. Now, with QNAP, they've also got a one bay offering in the TS-133, and if you include that with a 1TB drive, which costs vaguely around 199 quid uh, for the NAS and the drive together, you end up with that price point there at about 200 quid. However, you want redundancy, you need fallback because cloud does arrive, let's be honest, cloud service providers do arrive with a certain degree of failover there for your storage. You don't think about redundancy, you don't think about files getting lost because on a cloud service provider, they've got backup upon backup. So we have to put, at least put in redundancy and maybe even factor in a bit of backup as well. So that's where there's a little bit of parity there between cloud and NAS, because with NAS providers, you'd have to go for at least a two bay like the DS223 or the QNAP TS233, which retails for about two to 250 quid. Now, once you put the drives on site, it actually works out relatively similar. But again, RAID is not a backup. Now, what about if we take it up a little bit further? When you see a lot of businesses and the average data that is created by a business year on year, the general accepted number for three to five years of the average SMB, small, medium business, and even going up to the larger ones, sits at around 50 terabytes. That's your client data, that's your staff data, your surveillance, everything. Now, for legal compliance. So with that in mind, at 50 terabytes, this is when cloud kind of goes bonkers. And if you're only looking for storage, that's when you really get hit the worst. Because once you look at cloud service providers, cloud service providers include all kinds of add-ons and extras that come under the umbrella of SaaS, Software as a Service. They're not just providing you with the cloud, they're providing you with a myriad of tools for you to take advantage of. And that is how they often justify the price. On top of that, they provide service levels, they provide extras that are more tailor-made to certain data scenarios, such as larger archival, cold storage, and virtual machine deployment. But because this level of storage is just simply not available outside of a business presentation, you can't really get a domestic 50 TB on the cloud, the result is that the price tags go bananas. You have the likes of Blackblaze kind of keeping it, and I'm gonna say this with big italics, affordable, sitting there at approximately five to six thousand dollars but you've got to factor in your tax and you've got to factor in the kind of data you're storing but then you look at your aws your amazon storage 
you've got to look at your Microsoft storage there in Azure, and you look at your Google storage, and that is when these numbers go into the teens, at between 12 and in some cases $15,000 per year of 50 terabytes of data. Now again, failover. You've got to also factor in ease of access. There's lots of extras that are included with that price. But nevertheless, paying between $10,000 and $15,000 for 50 TB sounds bonkers the minute you start moving into private NAS. If we return to Synology and QNAP there, Synology and QNAP, you could pick up a very simple 4-base such as the Synology DS923 Plus or the QNAP TS464 for around $550 to $600. If you populate that system with 20 TB drives uh, from the likes of WD or Seagate, which will retail somewhere between $399 and $499 each, you're looking at a four-bay system that will set you back between $2,000 and $2,500, depending on where you are in the world, but you've actually got 60 terabytes of data in that in a RAID 5 and still have one drive of failover there. That is an enormous price difference, real-world money. And do keep in mind, of course, and we'll touch on this more later, that when you are dealing with um, localized data, you own the storage, whereas in the cloud, you don't. But more on that later. This now brings us into the enterprise tier. Now, we've already talked about home. We've talked about SMB, small, medium business. But when we get to the enterprise tier, we aren't just looking at three to five years of data. We are looking 10 years. We are looking cold archival. And that is when we are talking petabytes. Now, the number differentials between local, a privately owned server storage and cloud server storage, when it comes to this tier, is bonkers. Notwithstanding that we could already talk, as mentioned, about all the extras they throw in to sort of upsell the storage, when the majority of users simply want reliable storage, um, we can talk about these cost differentials because this is when they go bonkers. Now, all of this information comes from Backblaze's own site where they compare a lot of these cloud costs. And I actually had to recheck my script just for this last point of this video because I'd forgotten just how big the difference was. So for one petabyte, that's, again, we could argue mathematics, 1,000 terabytes of data, on the cloud, with Backblaze, it retails at $72,000 per year. For um, Amazon S3, it is $294,000. You hear that? Just shy of $300,000 for the Amazon storage, and of course for the Azure, $235,000, and $276,000 for Google. Bear in mind that Google, of all of the companies I just mentioned, have the most data centers. They've got more data centers than S3 and Azure, but never, nevertheless, um, the S3 option there from Amazon was just shy of $300,000. Now, that is a large amount of data, a large amount of capacity. What are private server owners bringing to the fold? We can step away from desktop. We're, of course, going to be looking at rack mount here. And remember, the goal is one petabyte of accessible storage, but also redundancy there. Now, if we look at the NAS world, we'll look at Synology first. Synology have come under fire in recent years uh, for their stance on compatibility, but with or without you factoring it in, you could look at their 60-bay rack mount, known as the HD6500, and the HD6500, which retails, which is a 60-bay rack mount system, for $18,000. Again, sounds like a lot. Remember those early numbers with cloud? We've got to fully populate it. So if we follow, fully populate this device, with 24 TB drives, um, then we would be looking at each of those drives costing around $500 to $550 per drive. But because of Synology's hardened stance on compatibility, even if we only look at their own hard drives, so if we look at the 18 TB drive series and populate that 60 bay model, those drives from Synology are $600 each. That means those drives and the system connected will come in at compared with $72,000 from Backblaze and shy of $300,000 from Amazon. It's a huge difference. Now, if we look at the QNAP offering, that would be the TSH2477X. And if we fully populate that 
and an expansion device in the 3087 with 24 TB drives, the total comes in at $22,000. There's also an option with a mixture of drives that will come in at just $12,000 if you want to keep things economical, but with a slightly lesser powered system. The point I'm making for all of this is, whether it is you go for the fully fledged crazy option with Synology with their drives totaling uh, with all the extras at 54,000 or QNAP, which has all the extras in the expansions at $33,000. Both of these options allow you to keep your data while simultaneously saving an enormous sum of money versus that of cloud. But it's not that simple, is it? There's more to it than that. So let's talk about some of the other things that are built in in the background of cloud and also things you have to consider for your storage that might tip you in the other direction or at the very least give you some understanding of what exactly cloud is including in that pricing. One of the first big things, I made a whole dedicated video about this by the way, that a lot of users forget about when it comes to cloud services is simply egress. You have all of this data going onto the cloud and every month or even every year, you are allowed, keyword there, allowed, that sucks, you're allowed to download a certain amount of it every month before they charge you because they have to dedicate a lot of their internal services to allow you to draw that data back. Now, when we were talking about 4TB, even when we were talking about 50 terabytes, we have to acknowledge that a decent percentage of that data was never gonna go anywhere anyway. It was cold storage, it was legal compliance, it wasn't gonna go anywhere. But what about that one petabyte option? And more importantly, everything between 50 and 1,000 terabytes there. Lots of users aren't aware that say, for example, their office was to burn down and they've got to restore the data onto a bevy of machines, they would be hit by egress penalties in the thousands of dollars. And let's not overlook the fact that when you do have to consider egress, if you're thinking of moving away from a cloud platform, bear in mind that once you end that contract, they'll probably give you 30 days to remove that data. And if you don't remove it, chances are you then lose access to it forever. And the problem is, if you've stored 50, 100, 200 terabytes of data, that means that you may be forced to hit that egress penalty just to pull that data off in time. And what about performance? All the data that you're going to be accessing, sometimes you need it at a certain speed. You need that data to be delivered to your system, delivered to your office, data exchanged from one place to another with tremendous speed. Localized storage, whether it is a high-powered SAN, a large-scale NAS enterprise-grade server, or simply a little box on the desk, will all add up to a much faster point-to-point -point connection for devices on the local area network, with a greater degree of control as well. Whereas when it comes to cloud services, you are very much at the behest of the exchanges when you are connecting to data from here onto another site. The result is that you are very much at the behest of one, the internet upload and download speeds from the ISP in both of those locations, but also the exchange server in the middle. And compared with the base level 100 megabytes per second that you get on the most domestic, low-powered, affordable NAS, to get guaranteed 100 megabytes, not bits, performance on a cloud service sustained is surprisingly rare and very expensive. So even if one of your sites has got gigabit internet and the other site has got gigabit internet, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you will be getting gigabit internet speeds between you and your data. And on the flip side of that, we can also think about the fact that when you're using your own NAS system, the minute you introduce more drives, thanks to the, the mathematics that go into multi simultaneous read and write from multiple drives, the performance of one drive is not the end of the road. More drives adds up to more drives being read and written from, and then when you introduce things like 10 gigabit internet, which will give you 1,000 megs per second between devices, you end up with storage that gives you both performance and ease of access. But what about security? Probably one of the biggest issues that users face when they keep data on the cloud of a particular large-scale legal compliance level is true deletion. Having data on the cloud does not necessarily mean that when you click that button that says delete, 
that it is 100% deleted. I think most of us would agree that when data is on the cloud, if we delete, we aren't 100% convinced. That's because cloud service providers, because it is their very bread and butter, will tend to have backup upon backup upon backup, server farm to server farm to server farm. And the result is that these systems can all too often mean that deleting data from one, you have to hope that that data has been deleted off the rest of the entire cloud network and all of their data centers. Moreover, with the cloud service providers, what if the data that you're submitting is being used for analytics? What if it's being used for learning models such as, you know, LLMs and other AI tools for image recognition? What if the data that you've submitted within those terms and conditions allows them to access that data periodically for improving the service. These are all things that on a domestic home level, you might just about get over. But if you are a business with incredibly sensitive and tightly knit GDPR rules, you just cannot tolerate. I guess the point I'm making is, keeping data in the cloud isn't necessarily bad. There's lots of users who will actually prefer to use cloud services due to the expense of electricity, not having easy access to physical space for those server deployments, and of course, accessing data remotely, they want a simple to set up secure tunnel to exchange data from site A to site B. But it is vastly more expensive than it has ever been, and I do think it's easy to get trapped into cloud services. So before you go ahead and arrange cloud storage provider um, services for you and your business or your, you and your family, take the time and do some research on localized server appliances. These days they are so straightforward and are only slightly bigger than a toaster in some cases. Obviously, once we reach the hyperscale, things are slightly different. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from today's video, it is that having your own server means true data ownership in a way that the cloud will always take from you. And if you're going to integrate a cloud into your 321 backup, fine. But having the cloud as your primary means of backing up is flawed in so many ways that I think too many users are so easy to click the confirm to keep it easy that they don't realize the milestones, tripwires, and issues they're going to encounter later in the life of that cloud platform. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I know we make a video like this every year, so I thought I would mix it up a bit. Let me know what you think in the comments. I also would like someone in the comments to at least congratulate me on not pointing out the sodding seagulls. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will see you next time.